What's cracking YouTube or the podcast, wherever you're joining us from, welcome back to the HQ. It's your boy Nicholas representing Big Dogs, BDGE, fantasy football as always. Today we're starting up a new column. That is the breakouts. Top three breakouts each position. That's going to be my Wednesday videos. We do In the Muck Monday. We're doing breakout Wednesdays, mock draft Fridays, live stream Sundays. If you want to join us for the live streams, make sure you got notifications turned on. Today, we're starting off with the running back position because I think that's the most valuable position in fantasy football. You find yourself a couple workhorse running backs in your draft and you've got yourself a playoff team. If you find yourself a few workhorse running backs at value later in the draft, guess what? You probably have a championship team. We're going to look at three guys that are most likely to... Excuse me, I need some energy for this one because I'm about to get hype. Three guys ready to break out. Maybe they've had some good seasons. They haven't put it all together. Maybe they're new to the league and they're ready to break out. Maybe some foreshadowing right there for you. By the way, if you're interested in purchasing these, available on the website, bigdogsfantasy.com. Head over to the shop section of the website. You can find coffee cups and, and, and all this other bullshit, but that's not why we're here. So let's get into my top three breakout running backs for the 2018 fantasy football season. All right, homies. So unexpectedly, a few spots opened up in the live draft, subscribers only live draft I'm doing this summer, where nine of you guys are going to be joining me in New York City. We got an incredible Airbnb. As you can see, this place is dope. There's a penthouse in Manhattan, in Hell's Kitchen. If you've never been to New York City, this is an awesome opportunity. If you're already in New York City, then boom, that you don't have to worry about traveling there. What we did was rent out an Airbnb for a weekend. It is August 24th to August 26th. Two nights, three days, we're doing a live draft. I'm bringing nine of you guys, subscribers only, plus myself, and we're gonna do a draft, and this is gonna be a fantasy football league for the season. It's gonna be awesome. And like I said, we have a few spots that opened up unexpectedly. So if you're interested in taking part in this league, we're going to draft together. We're going to kick it Friday, Saturday. We're going to go out in Manhattan, man. This is going to be a dope opportunity for anyone that is interested. It's going to be a higher priced weekend for you guys. I'm organizing everything. It's going to be all inclusive, all food for the entire weekend. Doing a live draft. We're throwing a board up on, on the wall. We're going to throw some stickers on that thing. It's going to be catered. We're going to be going out to restaurants. We're going to be going out to bars. Probably going to do an all you can drink Marg brunch. You know how your boy does it in New York City. It's just going to be a really, really, really awesome weekend, all inclusive. So if you are interested in joining the league, shoot me an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. There are a few spots left, so hurry up if you actually are interested. Serious inquiries only, please. All right, the first two guys I'm going to talk about should not come to you as a surprise. If you follow my channel, you know I love this guy. First one up is Joe Mixon out of Cincinnati, the Bengals running back. And the ADPs for these three guys, I took the average of MFL 10, draft, and uh, fantasy football calculator. He's currently going off the board 26th overall as RB16. Yes, he was bad last year. I understand that in his rookie season. I want to know, I want you to comment down below, what do you think Joe Mixon's floor is this year, realistically? In half-point PPR, what's his floor, his running back ranking finish? I can't really see him finishing outside of the top 15 running backs, at worse than RB15. My opinion, that's his floor. He's getting picked as RB16, though. So drop a comment down below. I want to know what you think Joe Mixon's floor is 2018 fantasy football. So go do that real quick. Hit that thumbs up button on the way down there because I'm interested to know. I love the fact that he's getting picked at RB16 and you're basically getting him as your RB2, which, you know, I love. You don't have to you don't have to pay the RB1 price for it. Bunch of things to consider when it comes to Mixon. He was a ridiculously high-ranking prospect, right? And obviously he dropped in the draft to the second round because he thought it was okay to haymaker a woman and Cincinnati apparently thought it was okay for him to do that as well and then they went and drafted him but we're not here to argue about that stuff they picked him in the second round he arguably would have been a top 15 pick had the incident off the field not happened he has had zero off-field concerns since the NFL draft so that's not really an issue in at, at the moment again last season was was bad and I was high on him last season coming in as a rookie and that was that was a mistake on my part and it was because I put his talent above all else like I watched him play a lot at Oklahoma and watching him play was it was it was a treat he was a snap. Double C's up. Double c up, capital C, lower KC. Really fun player to watch. Now, it's a mistake I made last year in the in the sense that I put his talent above, above everything else, above Cincinnati coaching, taking that into account above the depth chart there, above offensive line, above Marvin Lewis, his hate for playing rookies. I didn't think about how bad this offensive line was going to be after losing Kevin Zietler and uh, Whitworth, and that was 
clearly a, a huge part of what happened to the Bengals overall in 2017. That was a big storyline for them. I didn't think about the, the competition, right? I figured Mixon would blow Gio Bernard and Jeremy Hill out of the water, and I still think he's much more talented than those guys, but Marvin Jones is a guy who likes to stick to what he does. He doesn't like to make moves, and thus that's why he's been a awful NFL coach thus far, but also not here to argue that because he's going to be the NFL coach. And it took him a lot longer to win the job, Joe Mixon, I'm, I'm speaking of, than I expected it to happen. Eventually it did happen, but not in the way I, I thought it was going to happen. Heading into 2018, I still fully believe in Joe Mixon's talent. He was Graham Barfield's number one rated running back in his yards created column ever coming out of, out of school. It's a three-year sample size, but I highly, highly, highly respect Graham Barfield's yards created column if you have not if you don't know what i'm talking about go on google just type in graham barfield's yards created his column is a way to differentiate running back success from their offensive line so you know who's actually a good running back right you had guys like kareem hunt alvin kamara like all these guys that most people weren't that high on coming out he was super high on these guys and he's been able to call these breakouts and he had Mixon ranked as his number one back ever coming out of college in this column even though he didn't look great at times at most times last year he still ranked 13th in the nfl in yards created per player profile. So I don't think the talent is, has gone anywhere. I think it was just a really, really bad situation. Marvin Lewis hated playing. He hates playing rookies and playing them a lot. So Mixon was no longer a rookie. You could take that part out of the equation. He'll enter the season without Jeremy Hill and as the unquestioned featured back. You look at what happened last year and he didn't, he didn't come into the season as a feature back, right? In most of the first four games, I think it was, he had like single digit carries. Now you have the director of player personnel, Duke Tubin. Cuban for the Bengals, whatever, came out and told reporters at the Combine that the Bengals envisioned Joe Mixon as their bell cow back for 2018, which is straight from the Hefe's mouth. For y'all that don't know what Hefe means, it means boss. Boss is one who guarantee we go. You had the director of player personnel envisioning Joe Mixon as their bell cow. There was nothing that indicated that I guess he was going to be last year. I just took it upon myself to say he was going to be, and I'm not a Bengals head coach, so I shouldn't have done that. Just knowing that is huge, right? Just knowing what your position is, just knowing what your role is going to be in the offense, I think is huge because then you could just focus on practicing and getting better. That offensive line is still a major weak point in this offense. They did address it this offseason. First, you know, listen to this, actually. This is kind of funny. Their new offensive line coach, the Bengals, Frank Pollock, was the former Dallas Cowboys offensive line coach during their like dominant run, uh, you know, that they've had over the last few years. They took the Dallas Cowboys O-line coach and now the Cowboys O-line coach is actually the Bengals O-line coach. So the Bengals have had the same O-line coach for like the last 20, I think it was like 20 plus years. And they swapped co they swapped O-line coaches. I'm not really sure what was in it for the Cowboys, but that's neither here nor there. So they have an, an improved offensive line coach. Their biggest <coughs> weakness as a team was by far and away the center position. They addressed that immediately. Their first round pick, Billy Price, in this year's draft out of Ohio State. So that should sure up a massive hole that they had in 2017. And you just look at, if, if you watch mix and play, there were so many times where the nose tackle would just blow up the center and get and just smack him in the backfield. Another massive hold that they had was at left tackle. They went out and grabbed Cordy Glenn, the left tackle from Buffalo, who's been hurt, dinged up for the last few years. But when he's healthy, he is a very, very good and he's still relatively young, so he's got some years ahead of him. When you look back at last year, uh, they had Cedric O. I'm not even sure how to say this. Cedric O G B U E H I. Someone from Cincy, help me out there. Cedric O. Blah, 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 blah. For most of the season, he was PFF's 70th graded tackle in the NFL last year, out of 81 graded tackles. Also, 69th in pass blocking, 73rd in run blocking. When you split it down, so Cordy Glenn coming in. Shores up a massive hole, as does first round pick Billy Price. Their line graded out last year as 24th in run blocking per football outsiders, 23rd poor, per, poor. PFF in yards before contact for running backs. There were so many plays, like I said, that Mixon just got absolutely blown up. So any upgrade on this line is going to be huge for him, as well as Dalton in the offense overall. And it didn't help that they did face the third toughest run schedule in the entire NFL last year. Also, uh, Evan Silva pointed out in his Bengals team preview that Cincinnati ranked 29th in rushing attempts last year, which was very out of character for Marvin Lewis team. I went back and I looked at their rushing attempts in the last few years, and they have ranked top nine in rushing attempts in each of the previous four seasons prior to 2017. So as you can see, that was an outlier of a year and you could expect that rushing volume to go back up in 2018. Evan Silva's team previews, basically every offseason he does a column where he goes team by team, 32 NFL teams, and he breaks it down from a passing, receiving, 
rushing standpoint. Very, very, very good resource for fantasy football. In my draft guide, my BDGE fantasy football draft guide, which is available for pre-order, Less than two weeks before the price goes up. If you snag it before July 1st, you're getting it at a pre-order price. In there, one of my sections I think I'm going to do is I'm going to read through all 32 NFL team previews from Evan Silva and take the little tidbits that I like for each one and kind of give you guys a synopsis because there's so many little golden nuggets in there. But if you're not caught up, it's a really long read to read all 32 of them. So I'm going to take the best stats and quotes and analysis from inside each all 32 of them, and I'm going to put that into my draft guide, along with so many other things that are in the draft guide, of course. My top sleepers, my top busts, my overall 250 rankings, positional rankings by tiers, just exclusive videos and articles that you're not going to get on YouTube or on my blog, along with so many other things. So if you're interested, go to the site right now. I'll link it down below, as well as up here. Get a pre-order price July 1st. The price will go up July 1st. I'm expecting the first issue to be out either July 8th or July 9th. Don't worry, guys. I'm working hard on it. We will be hitting that date, and it will be updated weekly throughout the summer, updated rankings, updated articles, all that kind of stuff. So very, very, very cool, very valuable to you guys. Go grab it now for a pre-order price. And uh, what the heck was I saying? Everything for Mixon last year kind of seemed like it was worst-case scenario, and he still found a way to hit 900 total yards despite splitting a lot of work in the backfield, despite missing a few games and it was mainly because how good he was in the passing game averaging 9.6 yards per reception that was one of his very you know that was one of his strong points coming out of college he was he was arguably the most natural pass catching running back you know that we've actually seen in a few years i mean mccaffrey mccaffrey's almost I, i'd almost consider him a slot receiver at this point not really but you know you know what i'm saying mixing is just a smooth natural athlete and him being in the passing game is going to be a crucial part of his 2018 success but he only scored four touchdowns four rushing touchdowns last year which is really not horrible considering he only had six goal line carries altogether which tied for 25th in the nfl uh among all running backs last year so i think that number is somewhere that he could absolutely improve on as the bengals offense gets better as this line gets better he'll get more goal line carries and since he is a really big back you know he's six six one six two two twenty five he will be getting that goal line, those goal line carries. And speaking of his weight, this is something I absolutely love. A report came out on Roto World that Mixon came into minicamp weighing 240 pounds last summer. So when he was a rookie, came in at 240. He's supposedly now down to 225. Straight from the Hefe's mouth, his mouth, he wants to drop another five pounds, get down to 220. I absolutely love when running backs lose weight. I think it's a great, I just know from personal experience too, because if any of you guys have ever gone through weight loss in your life, you are just a better all around, I don't wanna say person, that sounds weird, but you could, especially physical wise and movement wise, everything becomes a lot easier. And we've seen it before in running backs. Even at 225, if he drops another five pounds at 220, he's still considered a very big running back and plenty of size to be a workhorse back. He's still ready to take a big, 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 big workload. And you look at what that did for Le'Veon Bell his first year. And this is the final point I'll make with Mixon is the comparisons between Mixon and Le'Veon Bell, I think are super, super warranted. Not only in their size, their receiving ability, their running style, right? They're both super patient and then hit the hole, but they're also able to lower their head and deliver a blow if they needed to. You look at Le'Veon Bell's rookie season where he struggled with efficiency. He had more overall volume than Mixon did, but he struggled just as much as Mixon did in terms of efficiency and yards per carry. Then he lost weight. Then the team upgraded their offensive line. They were actually a poorly ranked offensive line, just like since he was during his rookie year. Went into the offseason, upgraded the offensive line, just like since he did. And then he had his monster second year leap. And I could definitely see that happening to Joe Mixon, man. I just think his elusiveness, his receiving ability, his all around raw talent is there for him to explode in 2018. I think his upside is realistically like 1,400 or 1,500 total yards, seven to 10 touchdowns, an overall improved offense, clear cut workhorse role. Mixing could be an absolute monster for you in 2018. So grab him as your RB2 if he's still going to be there in, in drafts in August. And then we'll move to our second running back, another guy going right around the same spot as Joe Mixon, and that is Jarek McKinnon in San Francisco, 49ers running back. The days go by in the summer. The more days that go by, the more I love McKinnon. If you are in a PPR league, I don't think there's going to ever be a point this summer where he's not a value in your draft. Right now, his ADP is 24 overall, running back 15. So he's right ahead of Mixon. And uh, what I would say is this. Money talks. Money talks, my friend, and it talks loud. A lot of it talks louder. And that's where McKinnon is. He's basically screaming right now to the tune of... 39 or over 30 million dollars sorry over four years nearly 16 million guaranteed a lot of money for running back in today's day and age man 
Kyle Shanahan loves this kid. He's been showering him with praise all offseason. Quote unquote, there are so many things I liked about him, just visualizing how I would use him and the stuff we would do and how, you know, and how he got lost watching McKinnon's tape. He's expected to play that Devonta Freeman role in the 49ers offense that Kyle Shanahan had so much success with in Atlanta while operating as the offensive coordinator. And for those worried about Jarek McKinnon playing on third downs, we think he is a great third down back, quote unquote, from Kyle Shanahan, the Hefe. Hefe is like my new favorite word. I don't know why. I'd have some worries about McKinnon's usage given his size if, if they had anyone on the roster that would be taking away work from him. Um, or that could steal goal line work from him, but they don't. They have Matt Breida, who, you know, he did have really, really, by all standards, a nice rookie season, but Breida's small too. He was an undrafted free agent. He's like 195 pounds, so he's actually lighter than McKinnon. So it's not like you would expect Breida to take goal line work away from McKinnon. Carlos Hyde, this is also another opportunity that I don't think people are realizing. Carlos Hyde was second ranked second in the entire NFL last year with 16 carries inside the five yard line. Guys, that's a huge massive opportunity and the fact that you're expecting McKinnon to get a lot of those says even more upside, upside, upside. I know obviously the passing game is where McKinnon's gonna eat which we'll get into in a second. And on that point, Carlos Hyde had 16 rushes inside the five yard line. What I was just saying, Brita had just one single carry inside the five yard line. McKinnon didn't see a lot there, but that was because they loved to see uh, in Minnesota last year, but that's because they loved to use Latavius Murray last year. Uh, McKinnon had three rushes inside the goal line. He turned two of them into touchdowns. So, proven he could do it, I think he's in a ripe opportunity to do so. And like I said, why you obviously love McKinnon this year is in the passing game, guys. McKinnon's a ridiculously good receiving back. Very, very, very above average, a plus, plus in that, in that aspect of the game for sure. Super athletic, literally a 100th percentile spark score per player profiler. We talk about that Freeman role under Shanahan in Atlanta. Freeman saw nearly 100 targets in 2015 despite missing a game and not, we're not counting his 10 catches, 168 receiving yards and a tutty in, in his two playoff games that year as well. Um, and then he followed it the following season, 2016, a little bit less impressive, but still caught 54 balls for 462 receiving yards in 2016 under Shanahan. Um, and that, you know, that was all with competing with Tevin Coleman for catches and receptions and rushes and all that kind of stuff. So I think realistically, all you have to do is look at Carlos Hyde and what he did under Kyle Shanahan last year in this offense. 88 fucking targets, bro. 88 targets, Carlos Hyde. That was, I think it was fourth, maybe fifth among all running backs in the NFL. Absolutely a product of this offense and this scheme. He managed to turn 88 targets into 350 yards, zero touchdowns. But what do you expect from someone who's not really a plus pass catcher? You bring McKinnon into the mix, who is a great pass catcher, and what is he gonna, he's going to absolutely destroy 350 yards and zero touchdowns on 88 targets, right? So, um, oh, I gotta plug my charger in real quick. I'll be right back, I'll be right back. Okay, we better. Oh, also, in case y'all are uh, jealous about the Sticks jersey I'm rocking, by Sticks I mean Julio, of course. Atlanta, sign my man's Julio, please. Just give him a fat contract, I don't care. Anyways, yeah, if you're looking for some dope jerseys, some dope gear for the season, my man at the Jersey Jungle on Instagram is hooking it up. He gets authentic jerseys. I'm talking about like real stitched authentic jerseys. Basketball, NBA, NHL, MLB, NFL. Starting at $40 a pop, yo. And they are authentic. They are really, 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 really high quality. And normally when you find these people who do the authentic jerseys and they're shipping them over from China and shit, Shipping costs like $20 to $30 per order. My man at the Jersey Jungle, which you can see right here, go hit him up on Instagram, DM him. If you drop my name, if you drop BDGE, Big Dog's Gotta Eat, Fantasy Football, whatever, it doesn't need to be a promo code, just let him know I sent you. He will give you absolutely free shipping on your orders. These jerseys are fresh. Go check him out, drop my name, and he will give you absolutely free shipping on your purchases. Anyways, let's get back to it. So. I was saying, Carl Hyde ain't doing shit on 88 targets. McKinnon's about to get it. So, McKinnon on 20 fewer targets than Carlos Hyde had 71 more receiving yards and two more touchdowns last year. If you look at McKinnon's catch percentage, 84% last year using Hyde's 88 targets, that would put him at 74 receptions. Using McKinnon's 8.3, yards per reception in 2017, we're looking at 614 receiving yards. 
Combine that with, what, 200, 225 carries, you're looking at an absolute PPR stud, probably our mid RB1 numbers in full PPR. And the best part is Shanahan knows how to run an offense. He doesn't have that old school mindset where, you know, teams want to ground and pound, set defenses up and, and only throw to running backs on third downs when they absolutely need to. No. Shanahan says, fuck that noise. I know what I'm doing. This is why I'm developing some of the best offenses in the NFL. I want to get my best playmakers the ball in their hands, in space, as early and often as possible. They were the fifth heaviest passing team on first downs last year, San Francisco was. Listen to this stat. The New Orleans Saints were the only team in the NFL to target their running backs more on first and second downs than the Niners. San Francisco targeted their running backs on first and second downs on 31% of their plays. I'm not just spewing out fucking opinions over here, people. This is this is straight facts. This is BFO. This is hashtag big facts only season at Big Dogs Gotta Eat. You gotta, you gotta let that sink in. Look at the progressive teams who are doing well in the NFL right now with good offenses. You're looking at the Patriots. You're looking at the Niners who are going to be a good team. You're looking at the Saints. These teams that throw the ball to their running back early and on early downs and don't just wait until the end of the you know the, the end of their drives third downs things like that when you have a mind who who wants to do that and they get a guy like Jeremy McKinnon the ball in space on first and second down they're going to be set up for much more success Shanahan knows that McKinnon is set up for the ripe taking I think he's going to absolutely incinerate six, 65 receptions 70 receptions 75 receptions be in the top three among running backs, I, I think he's just ready to explode this year. So you don't need McKinnon to carry the ball 300 times if you want him to explode. I know he's not set up that body type. He could take 74 receptions and take those hits because they're not like running back hits, you know, up the middle. Give him 200 carries, 75 receptions, PPR stud. Guaranteed. Good night. And we move on to number three. But before we do that, before we move on to running back number three, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. FantasyJocks.com. Y'all know the deal. They've been sponsoring my videos all summer, so thank y'all over there. They are, actually, they are officially award-winning the number one rated fantasy football championship belt by the FSTA, the Fort Fantasy Sports Trade Association. Number one championship belt in fantasy sports, FantasyJocks.com. This stuff is super high quality. Grab one for your league. I'm telling you, it's way more fun to play for one of these things. You can have a ring. You can have a belt. They do trophies. They do some, like, real life-size Lombardi trophies. They got... What else they got? I don't know. Belts, rings, trophies. They do draft boards if you do a live draft with your friends. Um, they got everything over there. And again, number one rated. Very, very, very high quality. You can knock somebody out with this thing. Get your team's name engraved on the side. So every year uh, someone wins the chip, you have it in the history books, man. Ain't no one forgetting this big facts only right here. And uh, listen. It's really not that difficult. Have everyone chip in an extra five bucks on the buy-in. If you do a $50 buy-in for your league, say, listen, listen, bros, give me 56 bucks this year and we can play for a belt. Give me 58 bucks this year, we'll get a Lombardi trophy and a ring. You know what I mean? So do yourselves a favor, play for something more on the line. It's really not that much more expensive when everyone splits the cost. And uh, again, thank you to Fantasy Jacks, our sponsor for today's video. Let's move on to running back number three, and that is my Boy, Sony Michelle, New England Patriots. And a lot of people are hesitant about Sony Michelle, man. And I'll tell you what, his current ADP, 60th overall, running back 26. I don't know how it's that high. I love me some Michelle. I'm going to start this analysis off with a fact or a stat, right? A big facts only, man. That's pretty much the slogan for the summer. Do you remember that guy named Mike Gillisley? You remember him? I'm old enough to remember Mike Gillisley. I don't know if a lot of you guys are, but I'm old enough to remember him. He led the Patriots last year in carries inside the five-yard line. Mike Gillisley led that team in goal line carries last year. Yes, so you can go fact check that if you want. If, you were, if you're old enough to remember, Mike Gillisley barely played after the first quarter of last season. He was their starter, he played for the first month, and then barely played for the rest of the season. Still wound up as the Patriots leader in goal line carries last year. What does that tell you? The Patriots want to have one of those backs on their team so badly. They want to have a big body back, a bruiser, that gets the ball on the one yard line over and over and over and over again. 
like they wanted to do with Gillisley last year, and they were one quarter of the way of doing so before he fumbled his way out of the lineup, just like they did with Blunt the year prior to that. They draft Sonny Michel, and he instantly becomes the biggest running back that the Patriots have. And I don't I'm talking about the running backs that are going to play, because Jeremy Hill and Mike Gillisley are not going to play. So he becomes the biggest of the three-headed monster that you have in New England, thus making him that goal line back that the Patriots want to use on the one-yard line so damn bad. Mike Gillisley led their team in it last year and only played for a quarter of the season. <sighs> last year, Sonny Michel had 16 rushing touchdowns in his senior year at Georgia. 16. The guy has a nose for the end zone. Oh, wait, and that 16 rushing touchdown number came in the same season that Nick Chubb, also Georgia running back, had 15 rushing touchdowns. So imagine Nick Chubb wasn't there. I'm pretty sure Sonny Michel would have finished with like 29 rushing scores. The guy knows how to find the end zone. He can pound it in from the one-yard line. He's going to absolutely dominate goal line touches for the New England Patriots. And he's pretty good as a runner as well. He averaged 7.9 yards per carry last year at Georgia. 7.9. Number one. Number one overall. And he plays against SEC defenses, people. He's pretty good. Do you know just how valuable this role is going to be in New England, as it's always been? Oh, man. So let's look at some of the arguments against Michel. The obvious one is that he joins this Patriots backfield, which is filled with Rex Burkhead. It's filled with James White already. It's filled with a lot of heads, and there's no denying that. I'm not here to tell you that those guys are fucking dinosaurs now that Sony Michel is here, because that's not happening. They're both going to play outside of Sony Michel. What I'm here to say is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Patriots offense runs a shit ton of plays, always. I look back over the last seven years. Their average rank in the NFL, in terms of plays per game, how many offensive plays that they run per game is third overall in the NFL. They finished inside the top five in terms of plays per game every one of those seasons except one. All they do is run plays. They run so many damn plays on offense. He doesn't need to be playing in 60% of the snaps to hit the same amount of overall snaps that someone on another team might get at a higher percentage of snaps. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Like, since they run so many plays, his percentage of snaps is going to be lower, right? Because they already have those heads. But his overall snap count is going to be similar to those guys in other offenses because they run less plays overall. The Patriots, that's just a product of their system. Let me remind you again, guys. Sonya Michel was a first-round pick for the Patriots. A first-round pick. They don't do that with running backs, right? Everyone knows that was a big storyline. They said, after going to the Super Bowl and losing, they said, okay, what is our number one need? What is the step, what is the player that we need in order to take a step forward and win the championship instead of losing? They said it was a running back. They literally said, by taking Sonny Michel, that is what they said without actually saying it. That should tell you how much they like Sonny Michel and how much they plan to use him. You don't use a first round pick and not plan to use him. This goes into the second point, which is his fumbling issues, right? This is one of the red flags that people had with Michel or one of Michel's issues in college because he fumbled the ball a lot. And I get that. Fumbling is definitely a concern, especially considering he's going to this Patriots offense where Uncle Bill will sit you until your next contract if you fumble the ball. I get that for a running back. But again, I point back to the fact that they use a first round pick on the guy. What that says is he has a longer leash with his fumbling issue. You don't take a first round guy and say to yourself, yeah, if he fumbles, we're going to sit him, right? That's too high of draft capital in order to do that. So he's going to have a long leash. Had he been a third, a fourth, a fifth round pick, yeah, I would definitely have some more concerns about this being one of his weak points because at that point, your leash is going to be a lot shorter. But the fact that he was first round pick, you know, you're not going to use that heavy of draft capital and then be like, ah, you know what? We're going to sit him now. He's only going to play 20% of the snaps going forward because that's just too valuable of a pick to do that with. So I think Michelle's leash is much, much, much longer because of that draft capital. Um, so that's, you know, I think that kind of knocks away one of the concerns I have there. While it's still a concern, at least calms it for me a little bit. And then lastly, we have to look at what his role is going to be in the passing game, if you're being realistic with yourself, right? Because it's James White and Rex Burkhead, both very, very good pass catchers. I don't expect Michelle to be a 50-catch running back, right? I don't think that's realistic. Uh, but I do think Michelle has very, very sneaky upside here, and you shouldn't just mark him off as a zero, a zero in the passing game. And that's for a couple reasons. The first, the first is the point I've been making all summer and the point I just made with Jarek McKinnon and teams that are utilizing their running backs in the passing game, on the in the receiving game, on early downs. Getting these guys in space early 
and helping them succeed in the offense through you know that strategy. These are the offensive-minded coaches that know how to win games. In 2017, the New England Patriots, 29% of their passing targets on early downs, first and second downs, went to their running backs. The Saints and the 49ers were the only teams in the NFL to have a higher percentage of early down passes go to their running backs, people. That's the reason we saw Kamara explode in 2017, right? Because they targeted them so often early. It's the reason that we saw Carlos Hyde have 88 targets last year. It's a reason that we're going to see McKinnon explode this year, people. So, the Patriots pass the ball on early downs. Who's going to be playing a lot on early downs? Sony Michelle is going to be playing a lot on early downs because he is their primary ball carrier. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Sure, so will Burkhead. Burkhead will mix in there and play on early downs as well. But don't automatically write off Michelle as a zero in the passing game, right? While he wasn't utilized in the passing game much at Georgia, they had another running back who caught the majority of their passes. It was uh, it wasn't even Nick Chubb. I forget what the, the other guy's name is. He had like 30 catches. I think Michelle only caught nine balls in his senior season, but. If you look back his sophomore and junior season he caught 48 passes so he's certainly capable of catching the ball if they're going to play him on early downs the patriots will be able to trust him to catch the ball because he's shown that he can do that so don't just write him off i think he has sneaky upside and the other part where i think he has upside is also is on third downs because he is such a good pass blocking back that is one of his strengths very 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 good pass catcher which helps build trust in this offense because you know Bill Belichick and Tom Brady are going to love that about Sonny Michel. And if you're in on third downs, again, that is a pa- as much as I talk about passing the ball on first and second down, third down is still you know the primary passing down, and you're going to be utilizing your backs on that. So Michelle is in on third downs because of his pass blocking. That means you know it's just more opportunity for him to be on the field. So I think a lot of uh, – he's just set up in a very good opportunity, a very good situation for him to succeed in New England – and I don't know, dude. I just feel like I'm fucking taking crazy pills right now. Like, people aren't seeing what I'm seeing. And the guy has stupid talent. Going back to Graham Barfield's yards created column again, he marked him as the next most obvious running back to be a workhorse in the NFL in both the passing and receiving game behind Saquon Barkley. He had, like, Barkley his elite tier, and then Michelle was the clear-cut number two in his yards created column. And again, I remind you, Graham Barfield's column has pointed out a lot of breakouts over the last few years. Um, and it's it's pretty it's a pretty good predictive column in order to do so and he absolutely loves Michelle so I in turn love Michelle I love what I've seen out of Michelle when I've watched film I love the opportunity that he has here and the fact that he is in the Patriots backfield makes a lot of people scared of him so you're going to be able to take advantage of his later round ADP combination of talent mixed with the opportunity in this offense and the scoring upside here like I said on that one yard line they're going to use him even if you think there's risk risk involved I think the upside is way too high Um, the last stat I will leave you with Over the last 10 seasons, I look back over the last 10 years, the Patriots have been top six in the NFL in rushing touchdowns in eight of those 10 seasons, never outside of the top 12. They score a shit ton of rushing touchdowns. You know they're going to run in a lot of scores. The question to you as a fantasy owner becomes, who do you think will be the one running those in? And I personally can't imagine it being someone outside of Sony Michelle. So that is going to wrap up my three breakouts. But before we're done, I want to touch on a few other backfields. Um, But if you found value in this video, please hit that thumbs up button right now before I get into that. So just scroll down a little bit. I would appreciate it because I put a lot of work into these video guys. So if you find value, please hit that thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. I'll be coming at you with videos like this all summer. Um, And if you're on the podcast, leave a rating and review, please. I uh, highly appreciate that as well. But overall, man, there's a lot of messy backfields out there, and it's hard to predict breakout candidates. It's hard to, you know, once you get past the first few workhorse running backs, it's hard to kind of choose who you want in in a lot of these backfields, right? Um, And I can make this list and try to get cute and talk about breakout guys who are like ADP 100 plus, but I'd rather give you guys that I actually believe will break out, not guys that like have potential, right? Because I could sit here and talk about 50 different running backs that have the potential to break out, like of course. And I could hit on like two or three of them and be like, oh, I mentioned them, whatever. So these are the three guys I really, 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 really like to explode in 2018. Um, if we look at some of the other messy backfields, we have Green Bay. All the reports are talking about a running back by committee. If I had to choose one, I would take Aaron Jones. Indianapolis, we're getting a lot of the same reports. Marlon Mack is my favorite there. 
Who else? Detroit. I like Carrion Johnson a lot, the rookie back. If there's someone that's going to break out, I like him there. Uh, Chicago, I like Tariq Cohen as a little bit of a breakout back as well. Just in that spread offense, they're a team that uses, or, you know, with Matt Nagy there, they used, I believe, an NFL high. Uh, like 18 or 19 percent of their plays were run pass option last year and that was something that Tariq Cohen uh, saw a ton of success with both in college and in the NFL last year so uh, I think he has a ton of upside and a ton of target potential in their offense I don't know is what it is but yeah leave a comment down below again I want to know what you guys think is the floor for Joe Mixon and uh, what are your thoughts on these other uh, these other running backs what, who are some of your breakout candidates this year I'd like to hear that so that's going to wrap up the video Pre-order the draft guide, subscribe to the channel, thumbs up, go follow me on all the other social medias, it's all linked down below, and make sure you hit me up uh, via email, send me an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com if you're interested in joining me for the live draft in New York City, airbnb beat up, it's going to be amazing, so I'll see y'all on Friday.